Good evening. I'm Harsha Shivaram Hildebrand, Chair of the Lawyers Group of the charity Oasis of Peace UK. Welcome to our 11th annual Roof Lecture. It's wonderful to see so many of you here from the UK and abroad joining us for this, our first online lecture. As some of you will know, Oasis of Peace is the English translation of Wahat al-Salam in Arabic and Neve Shalom in Hebrew. Neve Shalom Wahat al-Salam, or Nizwaz as it is sometimes known, is a village of Palestinian and Jewish citizens of Israel working together to build justice, peace and equality in the region and beyond. Founded in 1970, it is located between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and, and its success has proved a model for many that have followed. Oasis of Peace UK provides support for the educational institutions of Neve Shalom Wahat al Salam, and the Lawyers Group of Oasis of Peace raises awareness of and funds for its work. Our flagship event is the annual Ruif Lecture. This is held in memory of the late Philip Ruif, the distinguished and much missed first chair of the Lawyers Group. By happy coincidence this year, the lecture is being held on what would have been his birthday. Philip Ruif was a barrister and a judge who was passionate about social justice. He came along to Oasis of Peace to stuff leaflets into envelopes and through his enormous energy and commitment, became the first chair of the lawyers group and then the charity, a uh, chair of the charity Oasis of Peace UK overall. He would have been surprised and we hope delighted to know that we instituted these lectures in his honour. Each year we choose a subject, a, a, a speaker who is preeminent in their field to del deliver a lecture on a subject of their choice. This is followed by questions from the audience. For this, our first online lecture, we have chosen to have a Zoom meeting format. So we're all in a room together and can see each other, even if it is a virtual room this year. We will hear from the speaker and have questions. And then after that, we will see a short film about Nevi Shalom Bahat al Salam and hear more about it from Sir Andrew Burns, Chair of Oasis of Peace UK. This has been an unusual year in which to decide who to invite to deliver the Roof Lecture. Due to coronavirus, it's spread throughout the world and the impact that it's had on our lives. I'm delighted to say that in the Right Reverend Rose Hudson Wilkin, the Bishop of Dover, we have found the perfect speaker for these challenging times. And she in turn has chosen a very topical theme for her lecture. Bishop Rose Hudson Wilkin is one of the most important spiritual and religious leaders in the country. She provides inspiration not only to those of her faith, to those of other religious faiths, and to those of no religious affiliation. She arrived in the UK at the age of 18 from Jamaica, where she was born and brought up, to start her religious service in the church army. The bishop has held many important positions in the Church of England. She has been chaplain to Her Majesty the Queen, chaplain to the House of Commons, the British Parliament, and last year she was appointed Bishop of Dover. The bishop was the first black woman in all of these roles, and the first woman to serve as chaplain to the House of Commons. The bishop has also made her mark on wider public life, she was appointed MBE, member of the Order of the British Empire, for services to young people and the church. This year, she featured in the power list of the 100 most influential people in the UK of African or African Caribbean descent. As you will see, Bishop Rose is extremely well known here and abroad, like many distinguished speakers who have delivered the Roof Lecture before her, who include the Rabbi Dame Julia Neuberger, the historian Sir Simon Sharma, the politician Lord Dubbs, the academic Baroness Deitch, and the journalists Majid Nawaz and David Aronovich. I think I can safely say though that the Bishop is the first roof lecturer to have featured in the pages of the British fashion magazine Vogue, where earlier this year she was interviewed as one of its famous forces for change. 
Tonight, the Bishop will be delivering a very personal lecture on what it means to be a citizen of the world. This is a very timely theme indeed. We are not islands as the spread of coronavirus throughout the world and international collaboration in the attempts to beat it have shown. In exploring this theme, the Bishop will draw upon her knowledge of Israel gathered through her visits there and her knowledge of Neve Shalom Wahat al Salam gathered from our discussions. At a time when many people throughout the world are unable to meet freely with their family and friends, the Bishop will show us how we can come together and how, in the words of the title of her lecture, my story is your story and your story is my story. Bishop Rose Hudson Wilkin, the floor, or should I say the screen, is yours. Thank you very, very much. I am delighted. I hope everyone can hear me. Like Jack, can I just ask you to, that's right. I can see that you are hearing me. Thank you for the privilege and the pleasure to be with you this evening. I'm really delighted to be part of your program this evening. So you've heard what my title is. My story is your story and your story, my story. I have had the pleasure and the privilege of visiting Israel three times. So being with you this evening for this special occasion is an added pleasure, albeit due to a limited familiarity. When I visit other countries, I'm always keen to see and meet with people who are not necessarily on the tourist trail, people who will show me a version of their city or of their country, all the time, of course, trying to remain safe. I try to go off the beaten track, seeking out people and voices that tells a different story to what is regarded as the norm. And I'm always keen to interrogate what I have seen and also what I've heard. Stories from the YMCA, for example, of young people from different communities who are living and working together and actually making a difference. Of the orphanage responding to the needs of vulnerable children, whatever their background, not asking where they belong to, but actually inviting them in and making them feel a sense of belonging. The ex-soldier speaking of how he operated from time to time. And he, in particular, he tells the story of how early morning between 3 and 4 a.m. that they would literally go along to the Palestinian area and just bang on the doors and get them up and interrogate them. And he talked about the, the sense of fear that he would see in the women. And of course, he also spoke of his regret that he now feels uh, of the way that he then behaved. And there's a story of the young woman who shared what it was like as a child, having to get up very early in the morning so that she could join the long queues to get through the checkpoint and then on to school. Of course, the same journey going back. On each occasion, I have been moved by the stories being shared, lived stories, always leaving me with a kind of sense that had I been born in that place, I too, could have been part of those lived experiences. As a child growing up in the early 60s, 
I recall vividly the intense conversations between the grown-ups and the dis-ease expressed on their faces as they listened to yet more reports on the news about some atrocity in the Middle East, the dehumanizing treatment of black people in South Africa. And as Christians, they struggled to understand the killings between Protestants and Catholics in Northern Ireland. It seemed endless day after day, week after week. And of course, trying to understand what America was doing in Vietnam. As children, we were not allowed to ask questions because I grew up at a time when it was children must be seen and not heard. So if the adults were having a conversation, you stood at a little distance, very much listening in, but not actually engaging with them. But I, I do remember sometimes covering my eyes at detailed pictures showing distressing images on the very limited access to the TV channels that we had then. I remember secretly praying that the adults would get some kind of control over these various matters, that people would stop hurting each other, and especially that the children in these places would be protected from harm. When you're a little girl and you're seeing images, you immediately are drawn to the images of children because they are like you. They are like you. As an adult looking back and reflecting deeper, I recognize that in reality, what I have seen and heard was indeed my story. Their story is my story. Why? It is my story because we share a common humanity together. At the height of the war in Bosnia, Herzegovina, I recall while ironing one day at home, seeing emaciated young men behind barbed wires on my television screen. I turned the iron off and I stood there watching the report and I wept. They were not Christians, they were not black, but we shared something deeper. We shared a common humanity. I couldn't get those images out of my mind for the rest of that week. And so on the Saturday, I went into the center of town. I set up a stall. It was an open uh, parade area where people had stalls. I set up a stall with placards. I brought along a table. Placards are placed around it. And there I held a solo protest. My objective, highlighting what was happening in Bosnia. I wanted to address the people who were going about their normal shopping. I wanted to stop them and say, did you know that this was happening? I wanted to show them the, the clippings from the newspaper. I wanted them to ask me what it was about so we could talk about it. This came from a place of genuine compassion, a depth of empathy, with a real desire of simply wanting to alleviate the pain and the suffering of other human beings. I had previously read about what had happened in Auschwitz, and I feared that what we could be doing was closing our eyes and pretending that we didn't know what was happening in Bosnia. I still, all these years later, having read the story of Auschwitz, ask myself, where were the people of faith in Germany? Where was the church? Why did they not speak out? Why was the narrative 
that allowed certain groups to be othered, not challenged. And actually, when we think about the church, while I was in Israel the last time, I met with the Roman Catholic, uh, a, a Roman Catholic, um, uh, what, are they, what are they called now? Um, what, what is uh, Vincent Nichols' title? I've forgotten his title. Um, but anyway, some, someone in, the, in that capacity. I met with him and I, I said to him that I was disappointed that when the Pope went to uh, Myanmar, that he did not use the word Rohingya. And he didn't use the word Rohingya because the Christians there had told him not to. The Christians there had said, actually, if you use that word, the, the leaders does not want that word used. And so if you use it, we are going to suffer the consequences of it. I found that painful that our Pope followed that instruction. I really did. And I said to the person there, I said, perhaps it would have been better if he had not gone at this particular time than to have gone there and not to have used that word. So for me, I have to ask the question, why do we allow ourselves to take the side of those who are the aggressors? Why do we not speak up? Is it fear for ourselves, as those Christians, uh, uh, it would appear, were saying in Myanmar? And then what happened in Germany to the scientists and the educators back then? Why were they not getting another message across about people's humanity? I found this report that I thought I would just share with you very briefly. It is by someone called Trevor Cooling, and it was published in the think tank Theos. And it actually calls on society to examine again the purpose of education. How do we have educated people who watch atrocities and pretend they do not see it? So what is the purpose of being educated? And in that report, it speaks of the need for education to contribute to the pupil's development as whole persons and not just to increase or enhance their knowledge of a particular subject area. This is what he says. Why should not science lessons contribute to the wider educational task of helping pupils develop their understanding of meaning and significance of life? The report argues that learning to make judgments about the meaning and significance of what we learn is actually what education is all about. And he goes on to share this letter. Dear teacher, it was a letter shared with the United Nations. Dear teacher, I am a survivor of a concentration camp. My eyes saw what no man should witness gas chambers built by learned engineers, children poisoned by educated physicians, infants killed by trained nurses, women and babies shot by high school graduates. So I am suspicious of education. My request is help your students to become human. Your efforts must never produce learned monsters, skilled psychopaths, educated Eichmanns. Reading, writing, and arithmetic are important only if they serve 
to make our children more human. So I want us to, to say, how do we contrast that with when we're looking for schools for our children? Because often we go for a school that is doing exceptionally well in the league tables. How many of us ask the questions, not just about the science department or if it is sports, the athletics department, how many of us ask the question, will this school enable my child, our children to become more human? Or are we simply just focused on the educational or intellectual attainment? I think that that is something worth thinking about. That when we, when our grandchildren are taken to, to visit the next school, maybe ask your children to ask that question. How does this school enable my child, my grandchild to be more human? We need the kind of education that is going to create better human beings. Education that will enable us to feel each other's pain and thereby seek a way to alleviate it. Let me now draw on a passage of scripture. And as a bishop, I make no apology for this. In the Old Testament, there is a story of two brothers, Cain and Abel. It's found in the Torah, so some of you I'm sure will already know this. Cain is deeply unhappy with the attention that his brother Abel is getting. And so he kills his brother. When confronted about what he has done, Cain's response is to ask, am I my brother's keeper? I wonder if we could dream together as to what it would look like if we were to commit to being our brother's and sister's keeper. And by that, I don't just mean simply about bloodlines or ethnicity. What would it look like if we were to be our brothers and sisters keeper? If we were to embrace all humanity as though they were our brothers and sisters? If we were to follow this path, we would be looking at a really different world. This would mean that we were exercising collective responsibility. In the last 20 years or so, I have witnessed a kind of climate that has been pushing for a different kind of world to the one that I've just been talking about. The push has been for an individualistic society. And not just here in Britain, but around the world. This is highlighted in the cry coming from North America, America first. Here in Britain, a similar message has been packaged around taking back control. At the heart of these sayings is the message that we stand alone, that we stand alone. And so we have to ask ourselves, if America is first, if America is first, then who is last? We therefore we are therefore creating a them and us. I am first, so you must be last or second best. And what of that cry in North America that we hear being chanted at political rallies. Make America great again. Since hearing that chant, I have been asking myself, when was America great? Was it when she forcibly took the land away from the native Indians? Was it when she enslaved 
Africans. Was it when she practiced segregation and lynching in the South? Was it great when she attacked those peacefully protesting during the civil rights movement? Or can her greatness be measured by the images of the disproportionate numbers of people, black people being killed by over excessive police brutality? This week, we had the sad incidents of the family of five who drowned while trying to get to Britain when the boat they were traveling in capsized due to bad weather. A 15 months old child is still missing. I have watched and listened to politicians blaming people smugglers for this and other tragedies. However, I have heard no commitment to meet with other heads of state internationally to address the deeper issues such as how can those claiming asylum be allowed to do so safely? How can those trying to reach loved ones be allowed to enter the relevant country safely? Over dinner recently, my son-in-law shared with us that his cousin had moved to live in Australia for six months and on his return had now decided that he wanted to go and spend some time in Canada. I stopped eating as what he had said suddenly began to sink in. I turned to him and said, it just occurred to me that if that was a black young man with similar means, he would not be able to move freely from one country to another unimpeded, just at the drop of a hat like that. The reality is, however, that from time immemorial, people have moved from their country of birth in order to seek a better life for themselves and their families. What do we think the British were doing when they went to Africa, when they went to Asia, to Australia, New Zealand, or the Caribbean? They were moving to try and make a better life for themselves and their families. A few years ago, I preached at a Thanksgiving service in Cambridgeshire for the American forces. I heard to my surprise, the following words echoed. You Brits, you were pioneers and pilgrims when you made your way to the United States of America. I remembered thinking to myself, pioneers and pilgrims, wow. Look at what we call those who are trying to move from their country today. I hear no reference to those who are trying to move from one place to the other. I hear no reference to them as being pioneers. Those people who died, the risk that they take, the courage that it must take for them to make that journey. And yet, it is as if they are just nothing to be reckoned with. They are asylum seekers. They are refugees. Isn't it interesting that the British in Spain are not referred to as migrants? Well, certainly I have never heard them referred to as migrants. They're called expats. Expats. And I just leave that for a second to filter through. Governments from around the world have got to address the issues that is creating the vast movements of people. No one wishes to leave their beautiful homeland and risk their lives and that of their families for the sheer fun of it. We need to respond from a place of compassion. We need to make their story 
our story, put ourselves in their shoes. If guns were raining down on us, would we try to get somewhere else? If our government was oppressive, wouldn't we try to move? If we were hungry and we couldn't feed our families and the land was not uh, producing, wouldn't we try and leave as they did from Ireland to America? Wouldn't we try and go somewhere else? People have always moved, but now suddenly we're living in a world that says, actually, you in your small corner over there, this is my small corner, and you are not allowed to take a part in that. And then, of course, I hear people, and maybe rightly so, saying, oh, but where are we, where are we going to put all these people? And, uh, you know, where, we don't have enough school places. We don't have enough infrastructure. And that reminds me of another gospel story. Because in the gospel story, the one of Jesus feeding the 5,000, in that story, we're told that after Jesus had finished speaking to them, that the people were hungry. The disciples, the disciples, when Jesus asked, how are we going to feed all these people? Surely they must be hungry. The disciples said, oh, don't worry about that. Send them away. They are not your concern. But we're told in that passage, Jesus had compassion. And so it seems to me that we too need to show compassion and respond to the immediate needs. We can work out the details later, but right now the people are hungry. Right now they are desperate. How can we respond to them right now? So all that we are seeing being highlighted politically is drawing us away from a sense of belonging and collective responsibility, where different identities are respected and everyone is allowed in the space of normality. Instead, we see what can only be described as othering of those whom we deem to be different to us. This, I believe, comes from a place of insecurity. A nation unsure about itself, experiencing financial challenges, and instead of addressing these challenges head on, chooses a kind of popular narrative that blames those who are most vulnerable in society for the predicament we find ourselves in. I was disturbed, disturbed to learn that a certain political figure, when not sharing the platform with the President of the United States, spends his time here in Dover, in my part, my patch, my, my patch, walking along the coast, watching out for possible asylum seekers turning up. Very sad going forward. I believe we need to develop the kind of courage that will enable us to interrogate ourselves and each other so that we can get to a place of self-confidence, breaking our insecurities and thus not looking outwards to cast blame. Get to a place where we do not need to define others negatively in order to make ourselves look and feel better. Let me introduce you to the African philosophy of Ubuntu. This word comes from the Zulu and Sosa language, which means I am because you are. It is part of the Zulu phrase, Ubuntu, Ungamuntu, Ungabantu. And it literally means that a person is a person through other people. Let me give some credit to, to Archbishop Emeritus of South Africa, Desmond Tutu, for popularizing the word Ubuntu. 
He spent a significant part of his life for so many years stressing the need for others' humanity to be taken seriously and not just black people's uh, humanity in South Africa, but people right across the globe. So we too must begin to look beyond our borders and think of the Uyghur people in Northwest China and the Rohingya people from Myanmar, what was once Burma, and all those who are fleeing from the various crises being faced around the world. I would just love to see our government, you know, take the lead on gathering others together and saying, let's resolve this issue so that people aren't dying in our seas and on our shores. As a child growing up in Montego Bay, Jamaica, I didn't know the word Ubuntu, but I learned, uh, I learned that I was human because uh, I had uh, a sense uh, of belonging. I did not have a perfect nuclear family, if ever there is such a thing. My mother was here in the United Kingdom. I was left behind as a child. And my father, he was around like so many other fathers of my time. I grew up with his sisters, my aunts and their family. Interestingly, there were those um, host of people who were not blood related, but within the community, we referred to them as family. They were uncle so-and-so and auntie so-and-so. My children to this day are still trying to work out whether the person who they used to call auntie or have called auntie and uncle all their lives, whether they're actually blood related. You see, during the time when Africans were enslaved, when the master referred to our men folk as boy, we gave them back their dignity and we called them uncle. We enabled each other to feel a part of humanity, to have a sense of belonging, a family to be a part of. The untimely deaths referred to as black on black killings has been a source of real pain for me because it tells the story of self-hate of believing others' narrative about who we are. We no longer believe we are of value, of worth, and that is why we destroy ourselves and each other. The Bob Marley song comes into its own. Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. No one else can free our minds. We need to emancipate ourselves. I truly believe that if we're going to see a difference in our society, in our world, then we must re-educate ourselves and one another about what it means to be part of the one human family. Someone once said that family isn't defined only by last names or by blood. It is defined by commitment, commitment, and by love. It means showing up when they need it most. It means choosing to love each other, even on those days when you struggle to like each other. It means never giving up on each other. Those young men who are incarcerated in our young offenders institutions, because of their actions, need to rediscover themselves and society need to find a way to let them know that they belong. The George Floyd inspired protest earlier this year, mixed with COVID-19, has made a far reaching impact on our nation and across the world. It has been proven that the walls that we readily build as part of our default actions either to keep us in or to keep others out, just does not work. We have been rudely awakened to the reality that the control we thought we had, we simply do not have. This surely 
is a time not to keep driving forward aimlessly, but to press the pause button. The building of higher walls and repeating the same slogans will not get us closer to being part of the one human family. Those visible walls are symbolic of the divisions in our midst. Resources, which should be spent on bringing people together, is spent instead on widening the gap between peoples. Going forward, we need a more conscious and intentional way of living, of being. One in which we embrace what it means that every person is made in the image of God. Every person is asked to be fruitful, to be enabled to work. This further enables them to feel that they are of worth contributing to something much bigger, making a difference. Governments across the world must stop focusing on petty, ideological, party political views. Instead, they should think about the purposefulness in our created humanity, where everyone is given the space to contribute, to be a part of the community, young and old, black and white, able-bodied and disabled, of faith or no faith. And the list goes on. The psychological damage that accompanies one's inability to feel a sense of belonging cannot be underestimated. The impact of always having to wait or seen as someone without any sense of agency can be soul destroying. I cannot help but think what we need to, that we need to rethink the concepts of first world or third world and be mindful of the language we use, which is demeaning or othering. So how do we build this new kind of world? And what role might faith be allowed to play? When asked what the greatest commandment is, Jesus quoted from the Old Testament, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. From Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself. We must begin from a place where we recognize the world as a gift to us. And as a person of faith, there is also a real sense that my gifts, my possession, etc., it's not mine to possess and to hold on to for dear life. Part of the funeral liturgy includes these words taken from the New Testament. We brought nothing into the world and we take nothing out. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Reflecting on these words is rather sobering. It reminds us as to the kind of relationship we need to have with stuff and so-called possessions. We are reminded too from the New Testament Gospel of Matthew, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If our hearts are thus occupied with stuff, materialism, no wonder they're not in the place of compassion. And in the Acts of the Apostles, we further learn that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, distributed it to anyone as he had need. We therefore, we do not need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to engaging in the world in a new way. We do not need to go out and start up another new foundation or organization of our own. Neef Shalom, Wahat Al Salam, Oasis of Peace UK are but some of the many organizations that are already patterning a kind of life and living that is contrary to the winner takes it all. I am particularly moved by the intentional focus on education. We need a world that is prepared to be educated for peace, a world prepared to cultivate the kind of values that we find in the school for peace. 
the lessons that we learn from this school, the new values that we acquire cannot be put on a shelf. They are to be lived daily. This is the only way we will make a difference in our communities, in our world. Emerging from these well-received lessons will be a new dawn where we show mutual respect recognize each other's humanity, receive the gifts each brings to the table, that which we desire for ourselves, to expect others to have the same desire. A willingness not to hoard what we possess, but to share, to work tirelessly on behalf of the voiceless and those most vulnerable in our world. For those of us who approach his life from a position of faith, remaining on our knees will be no alternative to engaging politically also, and using all the resources at our disposal to make the world a better place where harmony and peace becomes a flagship, where we walk hand in hand and side by side, irrespective of creed, color, culture, and name. And let us not be naive. There will be no, there, there will be oppositions because there are those who thrive on division and some who make a living by making sure that there is unrest. The recent news of the arson attack in the village community of Wahat al Salam, Niv Shalom is a strong warning for us to stay alert while seeking to bring different communities together. We cannot be silent. We cannot say it's not happening to me, so I won't bother. I'll stay out of it. We have to be there. They are attacking a successful educational establishment that is aiming to create a better community those opposed to peace are seeking to pit different communities against each other. I quote from the words of that community. We see any attack against our educational institutions or the village as an ideological crime, an act of violence and severe aggression perpetrated by the enemies of peace and its supporters. Their story must become our story and our story, their story. Let me share another message from them. We call on all our supporters across the country and around the world to stand by our community at this difficult time, to seek out the facts rather than the rumors, to unite against incitement and hatred and to offer succor to our educational institutions in their time of need. Buildings may have been burned, but our longing for peace and brotherhood is alive and well, and we will continue our journey. Your story is my story, and my story is your story. Finally, I'm reminded of the, the gospel story when Jesus said to this group of people, I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, you did not visit me. And they said, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty and sick and in prison and naked? If we had seen you, we would have helped you. Jesus' response was, inasmuch as you did not do it to all these others, you did not do it to me. So it's not about the people who we are related to by blood. It is not about the people who look like us and speak like us. It is about humanity. Your story is my story, and my story is your story. If we lived that, what a legacy for us to leave behind. Thank you. Bishop Rose, I was pausing there because I think if we were in a physical room together, there would be resounding applause. I can see people clapping on the screens um, a moment ago. 
Thank you, thank you. This is not a formal thank you that will come after um, we have heard you expand on your themes during the question and answer session that follows now. That was truly a, a, a powerful panoramic um, journey of a sermon where you have taken us around the world in 40 minutes. Um, I'm not surprised that you've inspired so many questions. Um, I will start with a question of my own before bringing in questions sent by the audience. It's on the theme of education that you return to over and over again in your lecture, and that's inspiring many comments from the audience. I watched a, a wonderful interview of you in the House of Commons by a very talented interviewer, a seven-year-old schoolgirl. She asked you what advice you would give to children of her age. And you said, enjoy learning, not from celebrities, but from the people who have really lived. Speak to your parents and your grandparents and learn from them. Can you tell us a little bit more about your message to that little girl about the importance of education in creating the better world that you've described so eloquently in your lecture? Thank you. I, I think for me, education has to be holistic. It has to be holistic. So we can't just think of something intellectual because I bet between us all, we can uh, uh, identify someone who is intellectually, um, intellectually amazing, but actually they fail when it comes to human contact and human interactions. So, so I think for me, um, I come from a tradition of oral history. My folks didn't, could not read and write. And although they couldn't read and write, they would insist, you go to school and you get an education. Because when you have an education, no one can take it away from you, they would say. And so we were learning, not just in that school setting. And what was good for me to in, in my school setting was that, I had teachers who were genuinely interested in our lives and not just that narrow uh, uh, nine till three when they had us. They weren't, it wasn't just about the subject that they were teaching, but they taught us how to carry ourselves, how to behave with one another. It was just an all rounded education. So I think for our children growing up, so, you know, so many of them spend all their time with Xboxes or whatever the, the, the new up-to-date thing is. They're playing games and they'll say, oh, we have friends. Uh, we have X number of friends. It's, it's like the Twitter thing. You know, we've got millions of followers. And I think, really? You know, do we know what friendship means? And, and, and so for me, education has got to be the kind of holistic, rounded education that enables us to be human, that enables us to be compassionate, that enables us always, not just to be thinking about number one, but to be thinking about the community of which we are a part. Thank you, Bishop Rose. That was very interesting, particularly, thank you for sharing your personal experiences of education, which sound like they were very positive indeed. Um, I'll take, um, I'll bring in a question from the audience that touches upon one of the, the many biblical references um, you shared with us. Um, uh, this person says, I keep thinking about the question you asked, what would it look like if we were to be our brother's keeper? With all of the people you have met and all the places you have been in, are there any standout people or circumstances which have encapsulated being our brother's keeper for you? Mm. Oh, that's a tough one. A tough one. Um, I think I would like to. I would like to mention. I have met uh, um, the president, the previous president of uh, South Africa, Nelson Mandela, and I found that a very moving experience. I went there to South Africa. I went into the cell where he spent so many years of his life and the fact that he could come out without being bitter but still ready after all those years now an old man but still ready and with a passion to serve 
and to make uh, that part of the world a better place. I, I have just found that deeply, deeply moving. And, you know, if, if, we, if I was to have a hero, he would be that, yes. I think you've probably described the hero of many, many um, amongst us. Um, I think we'll, we'll move on to um, something that perhaps touches on the very personal nature of the, the, the lecture or the sermon, I'd like to think of it, that you've shared with us. Uh, a member of the audience has, has asked, what role do you think bishops should have in seeking to influence public opinion? Um, I was interviewed actually uh, last week, uh, I think it was, on the radio here in Kent. And uh, because the bishops had uh, written a letter, the, the archbishops had written a letter um, to, the, to the government. And the, the interviewer said to me, you know, what right do they have interfering, you know, politically? Or words to that effect. And I said that, you know, they had every right. Now, when I applied for my role as chaplain to the Speaker of the House of Commons, the reason I did that was because I personally believe that faith, doesn't matter what faith or whose faith, but that faith should be in the public square. The reason being faith is who we are. It is not a coat we put on when the weather is really windy or cold or it's wet and we put a rain mac on faith is who we are so faith belongs in the square and actually i said to the interviewer you know the the the, the archbishops they're not asking for anyone to vote for them <laughs> and, and and what i have seen because we are expecting politicians are expecting people to vote for them they don't always do the right thing they, they do what they think is going to be popular and will give, bring them votes. And so I think that bishops, people of faith, whatever that faith is, have a responsibility. Once you are in the realm of a leadership role, you have a responsibility to speak up on behalf of the voiceless and those who are most vulnerable. And if we don't, if we do not hear prophetic voices from across the faith spectrum, when it comes to the voiceless and those most vulnerable, then I believe we are not doing justice to who we claim to be as people of faith. And, and, and actually when I read scripture, throughout scripture, it's, you know, God, the God who I worship and serve isn't interested in our religiosity, isn't interested whether, whether we genuflect, make the sign of the cross or, or go to the place of worship 10 times or whatever. Not interested in that. Interested in how we treat one another. In Leviticus, be holy as I am holy. What's that holiness? It is in our relationship with one another. Being our brother's keeper. It's very interesting returning to that earlier theme and some very topical comments there on, on living your religion, so to speak. Yes, it is. And, uh, and another question has come in, which um, perhaps leads on from that theme and picks up on, on your references to Neve Shalom, Behat al Salam, um, uh, throughout your, your, your lecture. I keep being tempted to call it a sermon because that's how it felt in the very nicest way. And so this question says, uh, asks rather, you spoke of us needing a more intentional way of living. This is the exact word that the community at Neve Shalom Wahat al Salam uses about itself. Do you think we would benefit from more communities which, rather than being organic, are intentionally planned and structured to ensure equality and respect? I would have to say a lot of yes to that. You know, I, I think sometimes things happen by accident. Sometimes uh, people do the right thing because they've sort of bumped into it. Wouldn't it be amazing if right from the beginning, people ask themselves, what kind of community do I want to live in? What kind of neighbors do I want to be? Neighbor do I want to be? Or neighbors do I want to have? 
what kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's like the children. I used to, when I lived in Hackney and actually when I was in the Midlands too, when I saw children on the street misbehaving or on the bus misbehaving, I would speak to them and my children would go, mommy, you can't do that. They're not yours. And I would say, of course they're mine. Of course they're mine. I'm an adult, they're a child. And you know where that came from? That came from my Caribbean upbringing. And that probably came from my African heritage, where it speaks about it takes a village to raise a child. So this sense of responsibility for all the children and not just my children. So that what I want for my children, I'm not content when my kids were at school, I would not be content and had not been content if they alone, if they were doing well. I want all the children to do well. And that's important. So I think intentionality is vital. We shouldn't just let it happen by accident because it, then it might not happen. So we have to step forward in a way that says, we want to make a change. We want to make a difference. Thank you, Bishop Rose. That um, very personal uh, final section of your remarks brings me nicely on to what is, is now going to be the final question of the evening. And I'll conclude as I started with a question for myself, a, a personal question. And again, I will draw upon your eloquent words in, in posing that question. So this goes back to when you were chaplain at the House of Commons. When you were appointed uh, uh, as chaplain in 2010, it's a role you shared with another priest. And at that point of appointment, one newspaper described him as an Oxford graduate and you as the girl from Montego Bay. You handled this with your usual grace when you met the journalist who'd written that article afterwards. And you said, and here I quote, I told him that he had unwittingly given me the title of my autobiography. When I eventually get round to writing it, it will be called The Girl from Montego Bay. So Bishop Rose, to bring the focus back onto you in conclusion, what lies next for The Girl from Montego Bay? Oh gosh. <laughs> um, well, I have only next month, uh, November, 19th will be my first anniversary as a bishop and more than half of it I was only three months in when we had lockdown so I've not uh, done all the things that I would love to have done by now and, and actually I went to a school um, within, the, uh, within three weeks of being here I went to open a new school and uh, when I, I did the assembly and you know, they had some speeches and when it was time to open the, the curtain on this plaque, I opened it and I, I didn't realize that I was doing it out loud, but I suddenly heard myself, you know, it felt like an out of body experience. I heard myself saying, oh my God, that's my name. Um, <laughs> because there was my name there, which I wasn't expecting foolishly or otherwise. Um, and, and the children were allowed to ask questions. One of the questions that they asked mostly in all the schools that I have gone to so far is, um, how long have you been a bishop? And I take great pride in saying to them that I'm a baby bishop because I've only just, you know, it's just been a year in. So I still, I see myself as learning. It is a steep learning curve and I'm throwing myself into it. I'm loving what I do because I love being with people. And not only do I love being with people, but I love to, to give them a message that is positive and hopeful. That really is important to me. Uh, you know, I want people of faith to live joy um, because, you know, I think our faith should bring us joy and, and, and hope. And, uh, and so I will continue to do that. And one of these days, I don't know how soon or how late, um, I will get around to that book. <laughs> <laughs> The girl from Montego Bay, one of these days, I will get around to it. But um, right now, my responsibility feels very much like um, 
learning to be the best bishop. And when I say the best bishop, I mean the best bishop that God calls me to be. And, and I hope that that will be one of service to the community where he has called me. And, and that community is all of Canterbury Diocese. And on occasions like these, to share and serve uh, to those who invite me to speak. So, thank you. Bishop Rose, you said you want to bring hope and joy, and you've certainly done that for us tonight. You brought us a lot of hope and joy. And um, I'm sure I'm not the only person who's thinking that they will go out and buy The Girl from Montego Bay the moment it is, I was going to say, written and published. That's absolutely okay. a wonderful note to end on. We could, we could absolutely carry on for a long time, but our time is up for this part of the evening. And I will now invite John Bowers, um, a long-standing member of the Lawyers Group, to give you a formal vote of thanks on our behalf. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure that uh, all on the call will join me in thanking Bishop Rose for her wonderful uh, address, uh, bringing a note of positivity into a very difficult uh, uh, time. It came as no surprise to me to uh, hear her superb oratory, the wide range of issues covered, but her positivity and infectious enthusiasm, having had the pleasure of welcoming her last year when she gave a sermon at uh, Brasenose College. I can imagine how proud uh, Philip Rueff would have been of this event. I'm sure that he would have particularly appreciated uh, your question, Bishop Rose, how will this education make mm -hmm. us more human? Uh, also the importance of not building walls and probably he would have appreciated what you said about Nigel Farage. And I also uh, thank uh, the organisers of um, this uh, event, uh, which has not been completely straightforward. Uh, in pat particular, Harsha, who chairs the group with efficiency and elegance, and Jack, who is uh, uh, terrific in his uh, organisational skills. I guess um, people can uh, simply, in the uh, quiet of their own homes, uh, uh, clap and uh, please yeah. accept uh, our thanks on behalf of uh, all of the groups, uh, Bishop Rose. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to, to John. Um, we've now reached the concluding part of the evening. We will see a short video about Nevi Shalom Mohat Salam, followed by an appeal by Sir Andrew Burns, Chair of Oasis at Peace UK. Um, Andrew is with us tonight. He has recorded his appeal so that some service interruptions that we had earlier on don't stop you hearing his very important message. So we'll see the video and then hear from Andrew. I think I have finally found the solution to all religious and political conflicts in the world. And I found it here at a place called Wahad Salam, the Ve'i Shalom, or Oasis of Peace in English. It all started back in the 70s when the founders wanted to build a community for Israelis and Palestinians to live together. Because sadly, in Israel, these people do not live with each other. But here, Palestinians and Israelis would go to school together, learn in both Hebrew and Arabic, and celebrate each other's cultures. That sounds fun, but it's not always easy. It's not easy because here, you really can't escape the other side, even if you disagree with them. Peace, it turns out, is very hard. And it probably does not exist here all the time, but it's the best model I've ever seen to date. <laughs> That's one minute. Bye. Thank you so much, Harsha. And first, thank you for arranging such a splendid evening. And thank you, Bishop Rose, so much for such a fascinating and thought-provoking talk. And my thanks, too, to you all in the audience for joining us online in such numbers. This has been a most fitting way to celebrate and support the extraordinary village of Nevi Shalom Wahat al Salam. The village is a unique example of an intentionally shared community in Israel. There are other mixed towns and cities, of course, 
but none whose dedicated purpose is for Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs to live alongside each other uh, in full equality with respect for the language, culture and history of both peoples. For nearly 50 years, Nebi Shalom Wahat al Salam has stood as a shining example of the peace and equality that is possible. Now more than ever, the commitment of the residents living alongside one another in peaceful cooperation deserves the support of friends around the world. The village faces many challenges from the difficulties caused uh, by the pandemic and the changing political climate to the appalling arson attacks inflicted upon the school for peace in early September. Uh, I'm glad to say that the village has responded very uh, positively and energetically uh, to that and continues to flourish and its influence continues to grow. As many of you will know, Oasis of Peace, which is the British Friends of the Village, provides financial support to the village's four educational institutions, all of which teach and inspire peaceful coexistence. They are the primary school for children, uh, the Nadi Youth Club for teenagers, the School for Peace for young professionals, and the Pluralistic Spiritual Center for all ages. I should like to thank all of those of you who have already donated to this evening's event. Your donations will not only enable us to continue supporting the village's vital work, but will help fund a current program at the Spiritual Center itself. That center provides a framework for spiritual reflection on issues at the core of the Middle East conflict and the search for its resolution based on a belief in the values of equality, justice and reconciliation. This year, Oasis of Peace UK has supported the center's religious leaders advancing justice and peace in the Israel-Palestinian conflict program. I have a mouthful that. This brings together Muslim, Jewish and Christian religious leaders for discussion and training in peace building. It's founded on the recognition that despite the importance of faith to many Jews and Palestinians, religious approaches to building peace are often ignored. This risks sidelining a potentially crucial perspective from the peace process. The Spiritual Center is using its extensive experience and network of contact within the leadership of the three faiths to develop a unique program that enables religious uh, lay leaders to become a, a driving force for justice and peace through the study of faith traditions in the egalitarian and socially aware environment provided at the village, this project will equip 17 young Jewish, Muslim and Christian leaders with the knowledge, skills and support that, they, that will enable them to lead their communities towards meaningful change. We should greatly appreciate further financial donations this evening and in the coming days. Jack Omer Jackerman, our Executive Secretary, is currently providing a link in the chat box and in an email, which you will receive shortly to enable anyone who wishes to donate to do so. For those who would prefer, donations can be made by check or bank transfer. Jack's office will be happy to help you arrange this. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you to Andrew for sharing with us what makes Nebi Shalom Wahat al Salam so special and the value of the work that Oasis of Peace UK does in supporting it. As he said, many of you have donated already, for which our heartfelt thanks for those who still wish to donate. Um, as you know, you can do so via the chat box or through the details in the email that will be sent to you. Also, in terms of spreading the message, the recording of tonight's event will be made available, so please do share it with your friends, family and wider networks. Uh, it, re it remains for me now to just say some final thank yous. Um, thank you to the Bishop again for a, a truly spectacular uh, 11th uh, Roof Lecture. 
I think you've given us um, another first. I don't think we've had a roof lecturer sing be briefly but beautifully in a, in a lecture before. Uh, thank you to John Bowers for his very eloquent words of thanks to you on our behalf. Um, for the organisation of the event, I would like to thank my uh, very dedicated, hardworking, talented colleagues in the lawyers group and of course in the um, Oasis of Peace office, including in particular Giacomo Giacomo, the executive director, uh, and Lauren Singer, his administrative assistant. Last uh, but not least, I would like to uh, thank you all, our audience, for sharing tonight's event with us. Um, all of you, together with those who've helped organise it, have, have made this evening our first digital event such a wonderful success. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at future events, a future Oasis of Peace events, um, who knows, maybe even face to face one day in, in the good old fashioned way. In the meantime, thank you again and good night. Thanks.